Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia Online. My name is Jason Freeman, and I'm pleased to be here to introduce tonight's guest, Neil Gabling. He is the author of Catching the Wind, Edward Kennedy and the Liberal Hour, called by the New York Times a rich and insightful account of the figure known as the most complex of the Kennedys. His other work includes An Empire of Their Own, How the Jews Invented Hollywood, Life the Movie, How Entertainment Conquered Reality, and award-winning biographies of Walt Disney and Walter Winchell. The former chief nonfiction judge for the National Book Awards, uh, Neil has earned a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Shorenstein Fellowship, and a Woodrow Wilson Public Policy Scholarship, among other honors. He joins us tonight with the second volume in his acclaimed biography of, of Edward Kennedy, titled Against the Wind, Edward Kennedy and the Rise of Conservatism, 1976 to 2009. It follows the lion of the Senate as he works to safeguard progressive ideals and legislation during an era of conservative dominance. The great John Meacham praises it thusly. With his trademark elegance and insight, Gabler has crafted a moving portrait of the last Kennedy brother, which is also a portrait of the last great creative era of governance in the United States. And that tonight's author, quote, has made a specialty of capturing the lives of architects of the culture. Mr. Gabler will be in conversation with Patrick J. Kennedy. For 16 years, he served Rhode Island's first congressional district in the US House of Representatives, where he was the lead sponsor of the landmark Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. He also authored and co-sponsored dozens of bills aimed at treating neurological and psychiatric disorders and served on numerous committees and subcommittees, including the House Appropriations Committee, the Subcommittee on Labor, and the Subcommittee on Vet Veterans Affairs. The founder of the Kennedy Forum, a nonprofit dedicated to transforming mental health and addiction care, Mr. Kennedy is also the founder of the Parity Rights Advocacy Group, Don't Deny Me, uh, the co-founder of the online learning platform, PsychHub, and is the co-chair of the Action Alliance's National Response to COVID-19, among many other public health groups. In 2015, he, he co-authored with Stephen Freed, the New York Times bestseller, A Common Struggle a roadmap to health equity in the United States based on his personal and professional experiences. So gentlemen, let's get right to it. Uh, have a great talk and I will see you in a bit. Thank Thanks you. so much, Jason. So Neil, what a pleasure. I, I uh, wanna say for our audience uh, how uh, grateful I am as uh, someone who, for whom my father was the most important person in my life uh, to uh, see you and, and write such a monument to him uh, and his impact on our country. Um, I have to say, when I was growing up, um, I felt like I had missed that liberal hour that you talk about in your first volume. Um, you know, it was just a, always a hard slog, it seemed to me, in my dad's life to fight the good fight. What I read about in the history books was this romantic era when people believed in serving their country, where it was a great thing to expand the circle of opportunity for more and more Americans, where, you know, public service was so revered and political leaders uh, were like at the center of civic life and action. And then, of course, uh, that was before I was born, right? And I was born into an era where, you know, Reagan uh, was telling us that the uh, best thing you could do is turn away from government, from public service, that, you know, everything was uh, self-centered in government. And uh, it was very difficult for me to, to reconcile this legacy that my family had with the, the reality of what I grew up with, which was a very anti-government uh, sentiment. And, um, for me, um, getting into public life so I could be even closer to my father uh, reinvigorated my feeling as to why this was such a great thing that my family felt so passionately about, because I got to see him on the front lines of the work that he did that you talk about in the book. But to start us off, maybe you could just talk mm -hmm. a little bit about the major theme, since we just have um, a few minutes tonight because history is biography. And this is not just a, a history of my father, but it was a history of the times in which my father uh, lived and worked. So perhaps you can kind of take a little bit about the first volume and track it into uh, this latest volume, uh, uh, Against the Wind. 
No, Patrick, you're absolutely right. You know, I, I didn't start this project and I started it 12 years ago. I didn't start it necessarily because I was impassioned to write a biography of your father, frankly. In some ways, I was a little wary of that because when I start biographies, I always like to be without prejudice. And, and I will be the first to admit that when it comes to the Kennedys, I am prejudiced in their favor. Uh, you know, the, the Kennedys have meant a great deal in my life, um, you know, in my political life and in my spiritual life. Um, so I was a little wary of dealing with someone about whom I had uh, uh, strong and positive feelings. It's just not how I, I do my work. Normally when I begin a book, I begin with a question and then I choose a subject who enables me to explore that question. And the question that had plagued me when I was thinking about this book now years ago was what had happened to American liberalism? I mean, why did this ideology, if you want to call it that, or, or program, which I think is a more accurate you know, uh, description, why did this program, which was the predominant political program in America for a good many years from the New Deal into the Great Society, um, why did it basically decline? Uh, what were the factors? Now, I'm not the first person to ask this. I may be the one billionth, but... Uh, I read many of the other accounts and they were not wholly satisfactory to me. And I thought, you know how to do this? The way to do it is to take America's paramount liberal, you know, Edward Kennedy, and to examine his life and to tell the, his story, as well as what is, in my estimation, the single most important story of America during his lifetime, the most important political story, which is the story of what happened to liberalism. So that's what this book really, these books really are. And, and you put it very accurately. It's a history of American politics as told through the life of Edward Kennedy, who is the protagonist here, and, and, and rightfully so for, a, for a, a reason I will give in a moment. But it is, the, it's a saga. I mean, there, this is a large cast of characters. Your father's preeminent, but there is Johnson and Nixon and you know, Reagan and Jimmy Carter and the Bushes and old Barack Obama, they're all here. And and I, I like to think that this is, for political junkies out there, this is the story of what happened. But now let me get just to, to your, your point, uh, Patrick, to answer my question. And I never have an answer when I begin a book, because if I did, I wouldn't write the book. You know, this is an exploration. And, and the exploration I, I found is that all of us were asking the wrong question. The question shouldn't be, why did liberalism decline? The question should be, why did it sustain itself for as long as it did? I mean, the liberal program is, as most of us know, an outgrowth of the New Deal. And it, and it was a, a, a product of necessity and the Great Depression. When that necessity no longer seemed to be as vivid in this country, because Americans wrongly, wrongly, I think, thought that they no longer needed the New Deal because the New Deal was now embedded in American life. Social Security was embedded. Eventually, Medicare got embedded. Uh, they didn't need it. At least they perceived it that way. So why did it keep going? And my answer was that liberalism had something and your uncle's and your father had a great deal to do with this. Liberalism had something that conservatism didn't have, and frankly, does not have now. And, you know, if, if I'm going to be perfectly honest about it, I don't think we'll ever have. Liberalism had moral authority. It sustained itself on the basis of its moral authority. That Americans did want to feel that there was aspiration in America. This is one of the things that the Kennedys fed. The Kennedy narrative wasn't a narrow political narrative. The narrative that John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy and then your father created was a large narrative of aspiration, of where this country could be, of the greatness of this country. And that was predicated on compassion and decency and tolerance. And those things sustained liberalism. And what ultimately contributed to the demise of liberalism was the conservative project, and it was indeed a project, 
to undermine and ultimately destroy the moral authority of liberalism. And they succeeded in doing that to the point where the word liberal is now almost an epithet in American life. But the, the, there are two protagonists then in, this, in these books. One is Edward Kennedy, who is the, the man who keeps the flame of liberalism alive. And when I say liberalism again, I want to be, I'm not speaking politically here. I'm speaking morally because the other protagonist in this book is morality. Yeah. Um, so as I said, when I was growing up, you know, people would just hurl the most uh, ugly epithets at my father. He was constantly pilloried and vilified. Um, obviously, um, he was really attacked because of his drinking he was attacked mm. because of his womanizing he was attacked because mm. of chappaquiddick and but you know in spite of all of this uh you know who knows how he withstood all of it because it was daunting but he was just driven and he kept driving ahead to do big things for people um and i had the really great honor of watching a lot of that in my life in spite of all of that negativity um, you know, he did the, uh, took on, you know, the whole apartheid. Uh, he, uh, going back, he mm -hmm. made such a difference in Latin America on human rights and, you know, was, had to face a gauntlet of, of folks who were hurling these uh, uh, epithets at him. And yet he was the one who really took on Pinochet. Uh, mm -hmm. He um, obviously, as you know, you know, domestically, you know, fought the good fight for minimum wage, immigration, fought for refugees, um, fought for health care, as we all know, fought for voting rights. Uh, um, it, it really was that he was the senator for all the country. He was the national issue. The uh, national senator. Yeah, it, he really did. It seemed as though the Senate was him. Like I went over there because we had the privileges of going over to the Senate and it was, you know, he was the big uh, personality on the floor and he was the office that was the busiest mm -hmm. and you know, he had everybody trying to partner with him from the most arch conservatives, uh, uh, Hatch, McCain, Brownback, Kassenbaum. Um, he, he had them all and they all wanted to work with him. And so explain mm -hmm. a little bit to people how it could be that the Republicans could, could do, go to such lengths to take him down uh, on, on many of his personal uh, issues. Mm -hmm. Um, but they they just wanted to partner with him on on the bigger kind of political issues uh, because it doesn't reconcile. No. You well, you know, it, it's I mean, I have a chapter in the book called Running the Senate. And that that's a quote that comes from Bob Dole, who was the majority leader of the Senate, who said Ted Kennedy is running the Senate. <laughs> so even the majority leader of the Senate acknowledged that Ted Kennedy was was the was the man. And and before I, I get to answer your question, I mean let's contextualize this a bit as well. 2500 pieces of legislation he co-sponsored. 700 became law. And these were not insignificant pieces of legislation as you just pointed out. You know, whether it's the the 1965 Immigration Act or the National Cancer Act or the Ryan White AIDS Act or HIPAA or uh, CHIP, the Children's Health Insurance Program, which provided health insurance for families who didn't qualify for Medicaid, but made too little money to buy health insurance themselves. I mean, there is not a life in America, not a life in America that has not been touched by the legislation of Edward Kennedy. And I make the argument that he is the most consequential public figure of his lifetime on that basis. On that basis, that his work impacted more Americans than anyone else's. But now let me get to the, to the nub here, which is how did he do it? How did he do it? Well, of course, he was a master of the Senate, but he was not a master of the Senate in the tradition of Lyndon Johnson. He was not an arm twister. He was not an intimidator. He was not a face slapper. Uh, he was not someone who threatened. That was not Edward Kennedy's style. In fact, I make the argument in volume one 
which ultimately pays off, I hope, in volume two, when I show him really in action in the Senate, that he got a lot of his talents for working the Senate, and I'll describe those talents in a moment, from being the youngest child in, in the Kennedy family, uh, and sort of an afterthought. I mean, he wasn't supposed to be born. You know, he just kind of came there. They didn't expect that there was going to be this child. And this child was, um, you know, basically the comic relief of the Kennedy family. Uh, you know, his nickname was Biscuits and Muffin. You know, he's a chubby little boy in a, in a family where everybody was supposed to be sleek and handsome and perfect. And he ultimately became that, but he wasn't when he was born. And, and my point here is that he learned how to function within that family, how to be the comic relief, how to be deferential. Someone called it a ninth child's talent. Well, he brought that ninth child's talent to the Senate, where he served in, in a very similar way to the way he served in the family. He comes into the Senate and everybody is thinking, he's the president's brother, he's a kid, he's barely old enough to qualify for the Senate, he's 30 years old. You know, he's going to rest on his brother's laurels. He has no laurels of his own. He's unqualified to be here. He's going to be cocky. This was the preconception. He was the least of the Kennedys. And coming into the Senate, he's going to be least of the senators. Well, Ted Kennedy took all of that seriously. But he also, again, took those talents, those ninth tile talents, uh, to the Senate where he was very deferential. And he understood how to stroke the south, southern bulls of the Senate, uh, most especially Eastland, who was the chairman of the Judiciary Committee on which Ted Kennedy sat. And he understood the chemistry of the Senate. In fact, Ted Kennedy himself used to reference that the, this is a chemical institution, he once said. It's a chemical institution, by which he meant you have to understand the rhythms of it. You have to understand how to stroke people. Again, he wasn't an intimidator. He was quite the opposite. His was not the hard power of Lyndon Johnson. It was the soft power of sociability. People came to love him. People came to love him because he was kind and he was generous and he was thoughtful. His thank you notes became legend. Someone said that Rose raised him well there's not a thing that you do that you don't get a thank you note <laughs> from Ted Kennedy on. He was that kind of man so that he never personalized anything in the negative sense. That's another thing. He never personalized politics in a negative sense. He always personalized politics in the most positive sense. That he, he would give you a gift when you had a grandchild or he'd send a dozen roses on, on the birthday of Robert Byrd's you know, wife. Byrd, who had basically wrested the whip position away from him, but he never held grudges. He was not, and Patrick, you may speak to this better than I, he was not a hater. You know, in politics today, which is filled with hate, he was a man who arguably hated only one man in all of his Senate tenure, and that's Jesse Helms, <laughs> but uh, who was a, a, a bitter homophobe and a racist to boot. But he was not a hater. And so, you know, it was very difficult to resist him. It was difficult to resist a man who was authentically decent and kind and good. Now, that's one aspect of it. And the other aspect of it was that he understood what people wanted and how to work them. And I think the best example of that, I, I always love this, and it's in the book, of course, is getting Orrin Hatch to co-sponsor the CHIP program, which I mentioned earlier, the health insurance program. Now, Republicans are not, I, I may be giving you some news here, but they're not big on helping anyone gain health care, whether they're children or not. It's not in their agenda. Uh, Kennedy always said to his staff, as soon as he would introduce a bill, he'd say, find me a Republican. Uh, because he knew, you know, if I'm, uh, this is not for show. I'm not just, you know, presenting a bill to show everybody that I'm presenting a bill. I want to get it passed. Uh, you, you know, Kennedy is considered an ideologue by conservatives, but he's a pragmatist. And anyone who really understands his career knows that his principles were devout, but his, his, uh, uh, Practice was pragmatism. So he goes to, to Orrin Hatch, uh, 
And, and how do you get this, this strict Mormon conservative who once said, I came to the Senate to stop Ted Kennedy from doing anything? How do you get this guy to sign on and co-sponsor a billion, multi-billion dollar children and health, uh, children health insurance program? Well, Hatch is a Mormon and Hatch abhors tobacco. So Ted Kennedy goes to Hatch and he says, you know, we're not going to take the money to support this bill from the general fund because we know you Republicans don't, you know, won't sign on to that. But how about a massive tobacco tax? You know, making it really hard to buy a package of cigarettes. Hatch signs on. And then he does something else that is so characteristic. That's characteristic of Ted Kennedy. But the second thing is also characteristic of it. You got to understand how this man not only operated, but who he was, because the operation and the man are congruent. If they weren't congruent, it wouldn't work. Orrin Hatch is a composer. He writes music. He records his music. He loves music. He fancies himself a kind of Stephen Sondheim of sorts. A member of Kennedy's staff, a senior member of Kennedy's staff, was a former Broadway singer by the name of Nick Littlefield, who ultimately migrated from Broadway into politics. Kennedy would take Nick Littlefield with him to Orrin Hatch's office and have Littlefield serenade Orrin Hatch with music. But when it came to the point where Ted wanted to close the deal, he didn't just have Littlefield serenade Hatch, which Hatch always appreciated. He had Nick Littlefield come in and sing an Orrin Hatch composition. And that closed the deal. And this was the kind of thing that Ted, and Hatch knew he was being played. I mean, it wasn't as if Hatch said, oh, I, I, you know, no, he said, I know I'm being played. You're having Nick Littlefield sing my song. But it was that kind of comedy and, and that kind of understanding. That's just one example of literally thousands that made Ted Kennedy as effective as he was. And I'll add one more thing to this. And we'll talk more about this, I'm sure. It wasn't just that he understood the chemistry of the Senate and also the physics of the Senate, which is the mechanics of the Senate and you know how to the parliamentary rules. He, he was a master of that too. I mean, the man was a genius in many respects. He was a social genius and a legislative genius. And that word is not you know, oversold when you apply it to the most successful legislator in the history of the Senate. But he had something else. And this is, this is really important to understand how we function because the kinds of things I just mentioned wouldn't work in the Senate today. There's not a Republican who's going to say, yeah, I'll slap a tobacco tax on something and, you know, I'll, I'll join you. Or who's going to succumb to having a Nick Littlefield sing a song. That's not how the Senate works. I don't have to tell you that. The Senate works now where Republicans are always united on almost every issue, 99% of them, to defeat whatever Democrats want even if it's something that they proposed three years earlier or whatever, as in the case of Obamacare, which was a Republican, <laughs> a Republican program that every single Republican opposed to, a, to an individual. He had that moral authority that I talked about because every single thing that Ted Kennedy did in the Senate was morally driven, sincerely morally driven. Richard Reeves once called him a publicly moral man. And God, he was. And so to, to cite a line from Joe Biden that Joe Biden said at the dedication of the Edward Kennedy Institute. And, and to, you've got to understand this because this translates into modern day, in my estimation. People didn't want to feel small in front of him, even when they were small that his moral authority was so large, his authenticity was so genuine that people realized to oppose him was opposing a moral force. And that was very powerful. And I'm sorry to go on so long, Patrick, but you know, I just, I feel so strongly about how this functioned, the moral aspect above all the others, which were also, you know, wonderful, uh, wonderful modus operandi 
Nobody else could do that. Nobody else could do that. Only one person could do that. And that was Ted Kennedy. <clears throat> yeah, no, I felt like um, he had this sense that he had to make the most of his opportunities. And he used to say to me, you know, you got to use that capital that's in the bank, you know, uh, mm -hmm. you, you, your uncle's paid a dear price for that. And we have to use it now before it, it goes away. And you got to use it for what they would want it to be used for. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I definitely felt like he felt like he was a servant of this greater cause. I think he had a great deal of humility about himself and his own mm -hmm. failings. And yet he had this sense of an underdog mentality that he was, you know, wasn't worthy in some respects. He just mm -hmm. had to try to make the most of the opportunities he had because of where he came from, the name that he had. And he combined it with a natural as you said, passion for trying to help the little guy, because mm -hmm. in spite of coming from a very wealthy family and being very, you know, privileged in so many ways, he somehow got that underdog uh, feeling in him that um, made him so, such an identifiable figure. I mean, his, his support amongst uh, average people his champion of labor issues. I mean, he really was authentic to him, like you said, um so when he died you know in well, his yeah, Patrick, may i just pick up on something here because yeah. i'd love to hear you talk about it you know i make the case in the book and you've just discussed it as well that part of his greatness it sounds oxymoronic but part of his greatness was his fallibility and his sense of his own fallibility great leaders i have a, a theory great great leadership begins with fallibility and your father you know, had a, a tremendous sense of his own inferiority, of his own fallibility, uh, of the fact that he he knew he wasn't perfect. I would even make the case, and I'd love to hear you speak to this, that, you know, he, there's a lot of transgressions in his life, but I always felt that he sinned to be redeemed, that in some way he inflicted these things on himself because he felt unworthy, and that only by sinning could he really seek redemption. And that is why, in my estimation, you know, he was, he was as great as he was because he understood people's fallibility because he'd lived it. He lived within it. He wasn't a leader up here saying, you know, I'll do stuff for you because, you know, I'm, I'm, up, I'm talking to you from the mountaintop. Right. No, he was, he was working from the foothills. And when he died, and I say this in volume one, and, you know, hundreds of thousands of people come out for his funeral i mean the outpouring the grief it was a presidential funeral for a senator but i felt then that it was a presidential funeral because people connected people connected to his own sense of fallibility you know the kennedys can be arrogant you know we we know that <laughs> but here was a man who was not arrogant can you speak to that i'd, I'd love to hear you talk to that issue yeah i mean i um i just knew he was i mean whether we were going into the hollers of west virginia doing uh forums on health care or uh whether we were uh, going down to the border and hearing people not being able to get health care because they're worried about being um arrested and sent back and separated from their families he he really internalized all of these uh, issues and they weren't some issue per se, they were people mm -hmm. behind them. And um, I don't know, he just felt like he had to be a war horse because he could, because mm -hmm. he was Ted Kennedy and he had the Senate and he had this huge uh, gift of having his the imprimatur of his brothers and he wanted to make the most of it for people who needed it. It was pretty simple. And he really just wanted to get more refuseniks out of the former Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. He wanted to make sure the, the refugees in uh, East Pakistan and, and now Bangladesh were had uh, their own country and freedom. He wanted to make sure South Africa was liberated. He wanted to go after mm -hmm. 
Pinochet. Meanwhile, he wanted to fight the good fight. He really like felt like he was constantly trying to get as much done for people with no voice. And he just relished having the power that he had because of his name and using it to help people who had no, you know, no access to power. But there's a lot of people who are rich and powerful and a lot of rich and powerful people in the Senate who never use that power to serve the most, the most marginalized, the most vulnerable, the poorest Americans. And, and you look at this life of privilege. I mean, you know, he grew up in enormous privilege. He could have done anything with his life that he wanted to. And yet he dedicated his life in a way that almost no other politician has, certainly today, no politician would even be interested in doing these things. It's, it's actually a curiosity to me that your father was very conscious of history and his place in history. And now we find there's not a, there's not a person in the Senate who cares about how history is going to judge him. Not one. Right. So, you know, I'm, I'm curious about that aspect too, is that, you know, he, he has this enormous power that, that, you know, hundreds of people who passed through the Senate had, similar kinds of power. Most people in the Senate are fairly wealthy, but they don't use it this way. They don't use it for people who also give them no political gain. That's right. Your father got nothing to gain. In fact, he had a great deal to lose uh, among ethnic Italian and, and Irish uh, Massachusetts residents to helping Black Americans, for example. And I end volume one and begin volume two with the anti-busing a protest in Boston in which your father is physically attacked and in one case had to run for his life because he advocated for something that they did not want. So there was a great deal of political loss involved, but not a great deal of political gain. You do it because, well, there's a line, I, I love this line. This is during the Reagan era. He, we, this is a line of your father's. We talked about the powerful appeal of our most decent values. You're not going to find too many politicians who are going to talk about the powerful appeal of our most decent values. But I, I would love to hear you speak to that to that issue. Yeah, I mean, he he it wasn't for black rights or gay rights or women's rights. It was about decency to all people. Like mm -hmm. it was the general feeling that it, it, it ennobled all of us to be. Uh, advancing something that was collectively lifting us as hu humanity for to recognize each other's uh, rights. And uh, I don't know that we'd all become, it wasn't like someone getting ahead of the other. It was about all of us um, being better for the fact that we did something that was bigger than us that, you know, and I think that his sense of history, like you point out, made him want to you know, go for the big things. Um, mm -hmm. right. So I, I, uh, again, your, your, uh, both your volumes, they, they talk about this, this moral authority. Um, talk a little bit about, because, you know, they conflated his personal immorality yes. with the uh, immorality of the movement. I think it's such a, uh, and of course got away with it. And uh, they sure did. Uh, you know, I just and yet the irony is they can be the personal embodiment of perfection <laughs> in their personal lives and yet vote against feeding hungry kids <laughs> and vote against, you know, housing and health care for people who don't have to vote against a minimum wage. It's so ironic that it, they are so moral. They're so much better than him morally and all. And yet they're voting for things that hurt so many people and frankly yeah. run against the, the, the faith of, um, you know, Matthew 25, which he had on his mass card, um, that to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. you do unto me that, that, uh, Jesus's message in the, you well, know, that actually is the, is the epigraph of volume one. Um, and the epigraph of, of volume two is from John. And and I read it only because I think these are so, you know, and this is very short, so don't 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 worry. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, 
but has no pity on them? How can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. If that doesn't describe you know, our political situation and Ted Kennedy's political motivation, I don't know what does. But, but to your point here, Chappaquiddick is a very important episode in American life, and not because it, it arguably denied Ted Kennedy the presidency. That's not why it's important. Uh, it's important because Richard Nixon and his cabal sat around literally the day after and said, how do we use this? How do we use it to destroy Ted Kennedy? And many people know that he sent down a private detective and other people, some of them posing as journalists, to investigate, you know, to see how what they could tease out of this to destroy Ted Kennedy's moral authority by using his personal weaknesses to destroy his political weaknesses. And Chappaquiddick is really the kind of, and that's the signal moment where the idea of one's character becomes, you know, can taint one's politics. Uh, so yes, Republicans are joyful. They think, you know, now they've got what they want, which is if they can show that Ted Kennedy is personally immoral, then, though there's no logic in this whatsoever, they can show that the causes for which he advocates, health care for all, minimum wage, as you point out, and nobody else was fighting for the minimum wage. And here is Ted Kennedy, I just want to add this parenthetically, fighting for quarters, quarters on the hour, for laboring Americans, while the Republican Party is almost unanimously against him. Because why would you want to give an extra quarter to a guy who making minimum wage can't even hit the poverty line? And Ted Kennedy was the only one who advocated for this again and again and again. It's kind of at regular intervals. Ted Kennedy comes into the Senate and says, now we've got to raise the, the minimum wage. But yeah, the, the, this was the whole plan, so to speak, was to destroy public morality by focusing on personal morality, and they were successful in doing that. And they were successful in doing it for another reason as well, Patrick, I think. You know, it, volume two describes what might have been the major political enterprise of uh, the last, you know, 50 years um, and longer. Uh, and it's one that's not discussed very often. But since my book is about morality, <laughs> It's discussed here, and that is the moral recalibration of America. You know, it's not easy to take all the things that we learned as children that are supposed to be the things we do, compassion, decency, tolerance, you can go down that line. That's how we're supposed to live. That's what I teach my children or taught my children. You know, it, it's not easy to take that and obliterate it. You have to find another system with which to challenge it. Now, morality is not something that, that conservatives have ever talked about very much. Uh, you look at the conscience of a conservative, which is kind of a the, uh, the Bible of initial conservatism, and there is not a word of morality, not one word in that entire book. But the book begins, interestingly, with Barry Goldwater bemoaning the fact that conservatives are always accused of, of not being like good people. And then he goes on to proceed through the rest of the book and show that they're not very good people. You know, it's, it's, it's very interesting. It's a very interesting process. But what does Reagan do? What does Reagan really do? He says, no, 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 no. Compassion, decency, tolerance. No, forget that stuff. Now, we're about hard work and, and self-sufficiency and discipline and loyalty. Those are the values that count most, not these other values. And when you replace compassion with self-sufficiency, well, you get conservatism is what you get, but you also get a party that fights against health care and minimum wage and all the things that we've talked about, immigration reform, all of those things. A party that is 
South African sanctions. You mentioned that several times. You know, Ted Kennedy realizes that to fight Reagan is really hard because Reagan has recalibrated the country morally, and it's almost impossible to fight him. Uh, so he has to pick his spots, and the and one of the spots he picks is the moral lacunae of Ronald Reagan, South African sanctions. Ronald Reagan will not sanction South Africa. The racist government of South Africa, he won't sanction them. It's not in him. You know, it's totally Ted Kennedy and it's totally not Ronald Reagan. And what happens is that in this case, Ted Kennedy attracts enough Republicans to override a veto. But but to, to just sum this up, this moral recalibration, I think, you know, Mario Cuomo probably had the best, the best kind of, of summary of it, where he said, Ronald Reagan's accomplishment is making the lack of compassion, denial of compassion is what he said, the denial of compassion, respectable. We live in that country now, by the way. That's the country we live in. And what Ted Kennedy's career was dedicated to is to putting compassion at the center, at the very center of American life. And, and, and it is, as you pointed out, it's so ironic that this man who lived to serve others and who lived to bring compassion to this country, even in the face of that gale wind that's blowing against him, that this man is reviled by conservatives because he drank too much or they felt he womanized or because he murdered a woman in Chappaquiddick. He didn't murder anyone in Chappaquiddick. I mean, the characterization of Chappaquiddick is absurd. You know, there's a car accident. You know, I don't want to go through Republicans. I can, there's two, you know, right off the top of my head who actually killed people in car accidents. Uh, and I never saw them reviled. I never saw the Democrats go after them. Never happened. Never happened. But it was a device. It wasn't sincere. And they didn't go around and say, Ted Kennedy's a really immoral man. No, they said, by, by labeling Ted Kennedy as immoral, we can continue our project of destroying the morality of compassion. And I, again, I feel very, very strongly about this because I think it's the way in which Ted Kennedy speaks to us today. He speaks to us through the morality of compassion of which he was the greatest proponent, the greatest proponent in American history, not just during his lifetime, but in American history. I think we'll go to Jason and uh, I'll get some help with the questions here. Um... Hey, um, thank you both so much, uh, first of all. Um, and I am going to uh, remind our studio audience at, at home um, to, uh, you have plenty of time to post your questions. So I'm just gonna hop on to the first one here. And it says, wonderful discussion. Uh, would you please address Ted Kennedy's speech against Bork and the Senate and whether you think it helped establish the pugnacious approach toward future Supreme Court nominees. Thank you. Patrick, you want to take that one? No, you go ahead. Go ahead. I will say, well, he didn't say it in the Senate. He said it the day that Bork was nominated. And, you know, the, the, the conservative approach to this is, this is scandalous. Listen to what he said, that the America of Robert Bork, there would be no choice on abortion, the America of Robert Bork, there would be no civil rights for Blacks, and I can go down the list. Every single one of those things is true. Every single one of those things is true. So how in the world can you say that a man who wants to stop someone sitting on the Supreme Court, who wants to deny all of civil rights, you know, the right of choice for abortion, and I can go down, he doesn't believe in a right to contraception, which now some members of the Supreme Court also do not believe. You know, one named Clarence Thomas, who says he's going to go after it. He's going to go after all of these things. I don't understand, except from a purely political point of view, how one can say that what Ted Kennedy did wasn't one of the greatest services that he ever gave to the United States. Can you imagine Robert Bork sitting on the Supreme Court? 
and what kind of justice he would. You don't have to imagine it. He said it. He said it during his confirmation hearings. He said, I consider sitting on the Supreme Court to be an intellectual feast. Well, tell that intellectual feast to the people who are starving because they're not going to have voting rights or not have choice as they don't have now or affirmative action or even contraception. I think it's one of the best things that Ted Kennedy ever did. And it's just unfortunate that he didn't have the same power for a host of reasons when Clarence Thomas was up on the court and, and where Ted, unfortunately, and he himself regretted this, sat largely silent, not entirely silent, if you read the hearings as I did, but still too silent. Getting rid of Robert Bork's, you know, getting on, on the Supreme Court is a, a major, major, major achievement. And unless you are, you know, a, a MAGA supporter, frankly, you wouldn't want to see him on the court either. So no, that's a great moment for Ted Kennedy, a great moment. And by the way, Republicans voted against him too. You know, this wasn't like, you know, this was just a Democrats trying to destroy Robert Bork. Robert Bork should not have sat on the Supreme Court. Neither should Alito. And Ted Kennedy knew that. If we want to talk about the Dobbs decision, Ted Kennedy knew that Alito should, shouldn't sit on the Supreme Court. And he was fiercely opposed to it. And he filibustered. it. But they, they got cloture. So, Neil, uh, I think part of it, too, is that he was trying to fire up the base, Democratic base. Right. So talk a little bit about that. I'm sorry, I'm jumping in the question. But, you know, no, with Carter do. and with Clinton and with, you know, others, he was sounding the alarm because there was no way to even just take for granted in the Democratic Party that people would always do the right thing. You know, you are so right on this, Patrick. And and let's let's just focus for a moment on, on his opposing Carter. There are people who say, well, he was just opportunistic, you know, a word that was often used for Bobby Kennedy, less less to, to Ted, but he was opportunistic. He wanted to leap at this chance to be president. He lusted for the presidency. I don't believe he lusted for the presidency. Uh, he ran against Jimmy Carter. I mean, if you look at personal conversations, own personal papers, everything. He ran against Jimmy Carter for exactly the reasons he said he ran against Jimmy Carter. Ran against Jimmy Carter because he felt that Jimmy Carter was insufficiently liberal in the only in political institution in America that protected the, the morality of compassion, the Democratic Party. You know, he thought that Carter was a trimmer. You know, he didn't believe in these things forcefully. It wasn't part of him. Carter grew up in a racist household where his father, and he admitted this, I'm not saying things that Carter himself didn't say, he said this, you know, look, I grew up in a racist household where my father didn't believe in the New Deal. You know, so though Carter was certainly no racist, I'm not saying that at all. I mean, and Carter wasn't necessarily a bad man. He and Kennedy had very different visions of where to take the party. But Carter's vision of where to take the party in Kennedy's eyes, which was to take it to austerity. Carter's main issue was how do we bring down the deficit? And, and I think Carter sincerely believed that this is the only way you can beat Republicans. But Ted Kennedy felt that this is the way you destroy the single institution that's going to help people who need help. I mean, their, their basic disagreement, and this, this kind of, it sounds technical, but it's not really technical. The basic disagreement was Ted felt we've got a Democratic House, a Democratic Senate, a Democratic president. Let's get national health care. I mean, why not? When are you going to do it if not now? And Carter's uh, answer to that was, well, I, I'll, he was forced into this, by the way, Ted forced him into having any kind of national health care plan. I mean, you read my book and there's no question, Carter doesn't want to do it. It's too expensive. He's afraid that Republicans are going to be after him and Ted Kennedy just forces him to do it. But he says, I'll do it. Okay. Reluctantly, you had to drag him, but I'll do it, but it's got to be phased in. Let's do a phase one. And then if that works, phase two. And Ted Kennedy says, man, you do not understand the Senate, which was absolutely true. Whatever one wants to say about Jimmy Carter, he did not understand the chemistry or the physics of the Senate. And Ted said, you know, you're going to get phase one. Maybe you get phase one. There'll never be any phase two. Do you think the Republicans are going to let him get a phase two? No. What they'll do is they'll rescind phase one. You'll never get national health care this way. Either you do it one fell swoop as Obamacare did, 
or you don't do it at all. So, and, and, and Clinton, very much the same thing. You know, he felt, you know what, his heart's sort of in the right place, but it doesn't beat strongly or passionately enough for liberalism. Hence, we have the Welfare Reform Act and other things of that nature. So, you know, and, and, and Ted used to say that uh, whoever gets the last word in to, to Bill Clinton, that's who, that's who Bill Clinton listens to. So he, he was trying to find allies around the president, one of whom was Hillary Clinton, uh, who would pressure the president to do the right thing. The moral challenge of doing the right thing is another term that Ted Kennedy had. The moral challenge of doing the right thing. But then parse that sentence for a moment. It's the moral challenge of doing. Why is the why should it be a challenge of doing the right thing? You ought to just do the right thing. But that speaks to what Ted Kennedy was up against. It's a challenge to do the right thing, but not for him. Not for him. For him, doing the right thing was the only way you did things. There was no other way of doing things. Um well, parts that you're touching on and, and people you're talking about actually led to a question that I had. Um, you talk in the beginning, uh, the protagonist of the book, and then I'm thinking, you know, storytelling wise and, and historically, um, is there a central antagonist? And, you know, you say Jesse Helms, but he's, I don't know, I would want mm -hmm. a better arch nemesis than that. Um and is it too easy to say that it's Reagan? Do you is yes. there is, is there is there a is there an antagonist for this book? I there guess. is, there is. And I mean, first of all, let's say that the protagonist, uh, you know, protagonist has to be very large for a story this large. Ted Kennedy's really large. I mean, who's larger than Ted Kennedy? So that larger protagonist has to have a lot of antagonists, frankly. And I think you know the the. The, the only one who even begins, and he only begins, it doesn't, you know, to, to match him, uh, is Richard Nixon. Because so much of what happened today, including our recent, you know, president, uh, is begins with Richard Nixon's idea that he will form a permanent political majority on the basis that, and this is one of the title chapters, in, in volume one, and I always love this. People don't want to be improved. Now think about this. For, here's, here's the president of the United States talking with his, you know, cohort there. And he says, yeah, no, they, you know, the Democrats are never going to do anything. You know, they're, I, we can beat them every time. You know why? People don't want to be improved. They want to prove people, but people don't want to be improved. And so when you look at the racial animus that Richard Nixon exploited. He called it law and order, but everybody knew what law and order meant. It meant law and order against black people. You know, when you look at, you know, the, the moral animus that he created, when you look at the way in which he drew on American resentments, the way in which he projected his own resentments, he hated the Kennedys because he thought the Kennedys condescended to him. But what he did understand is that Lots of Americans felt condescended to. And if he, he took his own resentments and he projected them on the country and he became really the father of the, the, the reactionary populist movement. In many ways, politically, he was quite liberal. And there's a reason for that too. Ted Kennedy once said, I think he has an emissary in my office, a mole. Because every time I do something, he, he goes out and tries to co-opt me. He did. I mean, he was so afraid that he would lose to Kennedy in an election that he spent a good deal of his presidency trying to co-opt him. So when you look at the political program of Richard Nixon, as opposed to the rhetoric, I mean, he does, you know, some OSHA and, you know, the Environmental Protection Act. And all of that's, those are all Richard Nixon. You say, wait a minute, how did Nixon do that stuff? I'll tell you how he did it. He, he hated Ted Kennedy, and he wanted to co-opt Ted Kennedy. That's why he did those things. Now, Reagan is an antagonist too, but Reagan is a sly antagonist because Reagan is not a man, I mean, temperamentally, he's nothing like Richard Nixon, as we all know, and Ted Kennedy actually liked him. Although he did say, I love this line, and it's in the book, 
he, he said to his great friend, John Culver, once his roommate at Harvard and later a senator, uh, when Culver asked him the first time that, that Ted Kennedy met Ronald Reagan after Reagan's election, and, and Culver said, well, what's, what's your read on him? And Kennedy said something to the effect of, uh, well, I'll tell you, after meeting him, I don't worry about whether I'm up for the presidency because I mean, <laughs> if he can be president of the United States, anybody can be president of the United States. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, Reagan is an antagonist in, a, in as I say, a, a much slyer way because Reagan puts a smile on things. You know, Nixon put a frown on everything. He was a master of the dark arts of resentment. He was a hateful man, full of hatred. And he drew upon the hatred of Americans, particularly on racial backlash. But Nixon was not a hate. Uh, Reagan was not a hateful man. And it's much harder to beat that sort of thing where the racism is there, you know, the antipathy to doing things to help the poor whom he loathed. You know, he thought being poor was a moral failing. And all, all conservatives feel that way, right? I mean, conservatism is a, a philosophy in which if you are poor, it's a moral failing. It's all on you. And so it's, it's difficult to fight that sort of thing. Uh, so he's a, a difficult antagonist. The, the, the Bushes both are antagonists, but especially W, especially W. Because W does something, he uses Ted Kennedy's good nature against him. And that is something, I'm, I'm no child left behind. He goals Ted Kennedy into supporting it because Kennedy does support educational reform and then he doesn't fund it. He refuses to fund it. And on the Medicare prescription drug, drug program, he galls Ted Kennedy because of course Ted Kennedy wants a prescription drug program. You know, who wouldn't? But basically what George Bush had in mind was not a prescription drug program for seniors. It was a government largesse for pharmaceutical companies. And, and Ted Kennedy got, got burned twice. And he said this, he said, you know, I, I've always trusted people in politics. And in fact, people always trusted him. Uh, that was one of the things Republicans always said about him. When you get Ted Kennedy's word, it's good because you can always trust him. But Ted Kennedy said, you can't trust George W. Bush. You can never trust him. And, and you talk about a person toward, toward whom he had antipathy. He had real antipathy towards George W. Bush because he thought he was a liar. He thought he was a liar. He lied to my face. And that no, Reagan didn't do that. Not even Nixon did. Um, so uh, I'm going to throw uh, two at you here at the very end. Um, and Patrick, uh, I'd like you to get in on the, the latter one. Um, somebody who very enthusiastically wanted to ask a question said, the, Hort the Hatch story was emblematic and so well told. Do you have a Songus Kennedy story or an O'Neill Moynihan and Kennedy story? And that's question one. And two, you know, I hearing things that you say about, um, not to speak about anyone specific, but a hateful man who taps into the, his own grievances, you know, uses his own grievances to tap in to the grievances of, of a lot now, of- Who could that be? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, well, and, and this is the question really for both of you, uh, the, the second one. Um, can you talk about, finally, and it, it, it's a great wrap up question, how this is a book for now, like how this book is extremely relevant uh, for not just historians to read, but, you know, all of us to sort of understand our current political moment. So first uh, anecdote, and then if you both could tackle that last one to, to wrap up. Do you have up. any anecdotes, uh, Patrick, about... Uh... Your father's relationship with Sagas or with uh, Moynihan? No. Yeah. Moynihan and and uh, and Ted were not always uh, did not always see eye to eye, um, and and actually they became bitter adversaries when it came to the um, the Clinton health care plan. Because Moynihan didn't believe that there ought to be a health care plan. He just, he thought, you know, you know, 85% of Americans are covered. Ted worried about the 15% who weren't. Moynihan said 85% are covered, forget it. And, and they were very antagonistic to one another, uh, you know, in that period. Uh, Moynihan was uh, chairman of the finance committee. Uh, so he had, 
jurisdiction. Actually, they fought for jurisdiction. And Ted was the, the chairman of labor. Uh, and they fought for jurisdiction on that, on that bill. So I, I don't have any, um, any antidote in which, you know, Ted, uh, you know, did some sort of kind gesture. I mean, there's so many kind gestures that he did, and I'm sure there are many. And, um, you know, I, I have, I, I can't tell it here because it's, it's too long a story, unfortunately, but it's in the book. And, um, and it, to me, it's the quintessential Ted Kennedy story. And I'll just sort of put it out there and, if you don't want to buy the book, go to the library and get it, because this story is quintessentially Ted Kennedy. It's the story of Ted Kennedy and the journalist who wrote the most vile profile of Ted Kennedy in his entire life, called Teddy on the Rocks by Michael Kelly in GQ. And when you read that story, if you read that story about their relationship, what Ted Kennedy did, when Ted Kennedy had every reason to loathe and detest this man more than any man in the world, that speaks to the character. You know, the character that often gets reviled by Republicans and conservatives of Ted Kennedy. You want to know about character? That, that story is one of the most powerful. I know I'm giving a teaser here, but still. You know, it's, but it's, it's one of the most powerful antidotes of character that I have ever ever, ever heard. Now, do you, do, Patrick, do you want to talk to, I mean, I, I, you know, what your father means for, for this, this period? And I, I have a few things to say about it as well, but. No, he, I, I think he was just he, such a believer in all the people that serve their country and believed in this uh, great country as an example to the world of how democracy can work. And um, I, I think it'd just be so hard for him to comprehend someone who's um, riding all of that resentment that we talked about mm -hmm. earlier to this kind of self-destructive um, inclination, which seems to be have taken over. Um, and, and we're jeopardizing the thing that, uh, you know, makes us the envy of the world in terms of our plurality and in terms of our rule of law and how we have a peaceful transfer of power and that unlike two thirds of the rest of the world where dictators and the number of guns you have determines uh, who gets the power in our country as, as imperfect as it is, like Winston Churchill said, worst form of government except for all the others, we, we somehow have lost the perspective of how um, precious this thing called democracy is. And, uh, it's it's really heartbreaking, you know, because mm -hmm. people are so distracted about things that really are inconsequential compared to, you know, saving the system of democracy as imperfect as it is so that we don't have to uh, live in the kind of countries that most of the people in the world have to live in with no rights and uh, no civil liberties and uh, worried about their own you know, the government taking over their lives, uh, which is the reality in most parts of the world. Mm -hmm. So it's so ironic that uh, government's been made the enemy in a democracy, mm -hmm. as imperfect as it is. So anyway, that's my little spiel. But uh, it, it's the, the, the excitement I felt growing up around, you know, having the folks can't come to my house with my dad holding court about how we could make this a better, stronger, uh, more affluent country, empower people who have been left out of the of the circle of opportunity, as he said. It, it was just exciting. It was you wanted to be part of making a change to make the country better. Like who wouldn't want the country to have a, be an opportunity for more people who were in the margins, in the shadows of life? That I just got inspired by that. It's and I and when you ask who, who wouldn't want to, we've got a whole party that would want to. I mean, I mean, my 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 answer would be, you know, very briefly, the story that these two books tell is the story of how we got here. It's the story of how we transitioned from the Kennedy and Johnson administrations when our hearts were big and full, and we passed civil rights legislation, we passed the Voting Rights Act, and we passed Medicare. To get to a point where the only thing that Congress seems to pass, although Biden did better than this, is tax cuts for rich people. 
This tells the story of how we got there. We need to know how we got here. And it tells that story. And the second thing I would say is exactly what Patrick was just talking about. This is a very perilous time. Democracy hangs in the balance. We may lose it. I think people need to be slapped in the face, frankly, to say, you know, democracy is so close to being lost, so close to being lost. And Ted Kennedy shows us a way forward. And the way forward, in my estimation, I'll just read you just very briefly something that Ted Kennedy said. He said, of looking at his future after they lost the 2004 election, no doubt we must do a better job of looking within ourselves and speaking out for the principles we believe in and for the values or the foundation. America needs to hear more, not less about those values. And that to me is what Ted Kennedy serves as a, as a model of. Ted Kennedy can show us that we are not in a political crisis. This is not a political crisis. This is a moral crisis. And Ted Kennedy understood that morality drives politics. And when we understand that, we may get ourselves, those of us who believe in compassion and decency and tolerance and all those things, we may actually pull ourselves out of this morass, this moral morass, where amorality you know, rules the day and compassion is looked on askance. And Ted Kennedy is the model for that kind of moral reckoning. I would say, Neil, thank you so much uh, for what you've done to give us a fuller appreciation of history and bring context to it because we are at a perilous time and we have better insight to how we got here because of history. And those that uh, fail to learn history, as we know, are doomed to repeat mm -hmm. it. So your your work and your fellows who are who are uh, writing history helping us understand and interpret it are uh, give such a gift uh, to all of us so i thank you so much and um grateful for your service really to well, our country in your own way um, well i am so grateful to you and and what you have done personally and and what your father did and your family did and for your personal kindnesses to me uh thank you so very much well, what a perfect spot to stop. It's sobering, but also powerful and inspiring. And um, I, I'm sure everyone at home thought so too. So uh, again, Neil, Patrick, we was, uh, just wanted to thank you so much. Um, we hope to see you at the library for the next ones. And uh, yeah, everybody at home, have a good night. Again, thank you both so much. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, thank everybody. So and good night, right, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night.